Ironically, it was the darkness of the Great Depression that directed Max Elvin toward his bright future. Well, I started as a caddy at the Cumberland Country Club and uh, caddied there for about eight years. We both were caddying here in elementary school and that was back during the, uh, the Depression, which uh, was very difficult uh, having enough food on the table. It wasn't easy if your parent did not have a job. Um, very few women worked in that, and if the man didn't work, the father didn't work, well, there was no income. As a result, the children were out there trying to make a few dollars. The times around 1930s were difficult and tremendous depression. And every young boy was trying to help his mother and dad. Some were delivering papers, but there was no money in going out at 5.30 to deliver papers. So I went and in, got involved in caddying. And I was only 10 years old, of course, and uh, you were supposed to be 12, but the pro took me in, and that was my start. It was a chance to get 60 cents for 18 holes. Can you imagine that? And if you did not caddy well, you can bet your little daddies you're not going to get no other jobs because you had to be and as a result, when uh, we started caddying, there was about 75 to 100 caddies every day. Even then, Max displayed the characteristics that would contribute to his later success. First came in the morning, got the first job. In other words, you signed up in the morning. And Max was, Max was a hustler. He's always been a hustler. On the other hand, uh, Max was so delightful personality that the members took to him right away. There wasn't any if and ands about it. And as a result, he'd become a very popular caddy. However, Max's career in golf would not materialize until a fateful meeting with the man who would become his mentor. He, as myself, wanted to be a golf pro from the time we were 12, 13 years old. Now, there's only one golf course within 65 miles, so <laughs> there wasn't that many jobs open. After I finished high school, I was interested in trying to get involved in golf, and I was playing in a tournament in Bedford, Pennsylvania, and ran into Lou Worsham. And uh, he uh, came to me and said, would you like to get involved in professional golf? And I said, I'd like to, but there's no opportunity in my town. I was interested in bookkeeping and accounting and that type of thing. And so I, I wanted to try to pursue it as a career at that point, I think. At that time, Lou Worsham was the head professional at the famous Burning Tree Club in Bethesda, Maryland. He not only offered Max the opportunity to become an assistant at Burning Tree. He was like a brother to me. He, he took me in at Burning Tree. He, he uh, gave me opportunities and, and uh, made things available that I ordinarily wouldn't have had access to. He was a, one of the real premium players at that time, but he had warmth. He had feeling for people. And he, as I said earlier, he treated me like a son. So that attracted me a great deal. After his stint of active duty in World War II, Max returned to Burning Tree, where Lou Worsham was becoming interested in playing the tournament circuit. In May of 1946, Max Elvin became head professional at Burning Tree, a position which he has filled with distinction ever since. Throughout that time, his main focus at Burning Tree has been on one thing. Service to the members. All I have to sell is service. And I've had wonderful staff of assistants, over the years, I've had 38 go on their own as head professionals, and I'm proud of it. I think anybody trained by Max Elvin could handle a golf job without any problem. And I think anybody that met Max Elvin be tickled to death to think that they're going to get an assistant that Max has trained. But Max's career in golf was not limited to burning tree. We both became active in the Middle Atlantic PGA. Max was the an officer and a president of Middle Atlantic prior to, to my going in. We were always involved in the PGA. We were involved in the section PGA, and then later we were involved in the national PGA because he, he ran for office and became president. As president of the PGA of America, Max Elvin guided the association through some of its most turbulent times. My first responsibility was uh, the hiring of a new executive director. We had, we had been operating for many, many years with a uh, executive secretary. And uh, a, a business firm uh, suggested that we change our manner of operations. So it was my responsibility to hire an executive director. And we did that at quite a considerable cost, which is peanuts today. But that was a difficult thing to do. A young man going in and telling this older man he's 
and he was receptive. Tom Crane was very receptive, and he really was looking for someone to approach him along these lines. So that was number one. After we did that, then other things came into to being. I, uh, I knew the, the picture with the tournament professionals was, was a difficult one because we were arguing over control. And uh, it was a long, drawn-out deal and unpleasant. It was a very, very difficult time because you could never get your teeth into doing something. It was just a constant fight, a constant battle. And, and some of the players we were dealing with were really just plain hard-nosed guys, and they were difficult. I think Max handled it very well. Uh, I'd say he handled uh, a very difficult time very well. My prayers were not answered. I was hoping that uh, there never would be a, have been a split. A split, I don't think, improved uh, our association. We were all together, and still are for the most part. These fellows are still members of our association, but they are uh, another group within the association, and it's a pity that we had to split because th these things would have gone on and, and mushroomed uh, just as they've been. You see, uh, we had a difficult thing to, to do then. We had the tour to operate as well as our other routine uh, functions within our organization. Uh, they're doing well, I'm sure. I think we would have done just as well if we could have gotten ourselves together and, and avoided the conflict, which has been a painful sore. But it's all healed now, I think, pretty well. Throughout a distinguished career in golf, Max Elvin holds one particular distinction for which he is perhaps best known. Probably being the president's pro, you know, it's, everybody says, you know, and then when Max is, or when you sit down with Max and you start talking, you know, it's interesting, he can talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, George Mitchell or before Clinton or anybody, just almost on a first team basis. Now, he doesn't do that, but I mean, they're in and you're just talking different things and he always has interesting stories. Max's presidential pupils included Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and George Bush, giving Max the opportunity to know some of the most powerful and influential men in history. They had feeling for other people. They respected other people, and, and they were warm. Most of the presidents that I've known have been very down-to-earth people. But their position as leader of our nation did not entitle any president visiting Burning Tree preferential treatment from the head professional. I decided long ago, I made up my mind that uh, I was going to treat all of our members the same. And I didn't show a difference with anyone. I, I tried my best to treat one on an equal level with the other. And he respected that. And when he would come to play, I didn't bother him unless he asked me. I had to think of other members. I was, it was suggested by another member that as soon as he came, I do this or do that, and I said, no, I can't do that because I have 300 and some members at this point to think about, and I have to treat everybody alike. So no, it didn't. They're very nice people. They, they as, as our members here, we we uh, a bunch of wonderful people, and, and I respect them, and I hope they respect me. As a true legend of the game of golf, Respect is one thing Max Elvin has plenty of. To my knowledge, I never heard a golf pro at a PGA meeting, which I can recall being 200 people there, and Max would get up and be asked to say a few words. I never heard one person ever say one cross word. Not one. And uh, I think he's maintained that uh, his life. I think Max has a just a very, very good, solid golf professional he has been. And, and he's given up. Uh, I think you have to do. A lot of our people don't do it. A lot of our people don't get involved in the PGA. They always say, well, what do you want to do that for? I don't have time to do that. But I think you have to do it. You have to dedicate your time to make the game itself better and make your profession better. And he certainly has done that. I owe Max a lot. I owe Max has stood by me, and uh, and I told you when I was here, very seriously ill, unconscious, he came from Washington up here to see me, and uh, I never realized until a month or so later that he had been here. Uh, but that's kind of the man he is. If it hadn't been for the game of golf, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to to go places that I've gone. Heck, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to Buckingham Palace. 
I wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to various parts of the world. I had an audience with the Pope in Rome. I, I, these have been things that were, were created because of my being in golf, associated with the presence of the United States. I, golf has done this for me. I owe everything to this game.